Well, good evening and welcome to Casa Bacardi and this first of a series on Cubans in America dedicated to a very distinguished uh, lawyer, uh, entrepreneur, Cesar Alvarez, who is the chairman of Greenberg Traurig, has made a significant a significant contribution to this community, and we are proud that this series is named uh, for him. Uh, we also want to thank a very generous uh, philanthropic individual, a friend of the university, a friend of us, that has given us funding to organize this series and other activities. Uh, he would like to remain anonymous, but we are very grateful for his support. Very important. Huh? <laughs> this series is the result of a uh, epiphany that I had visiting Australia and walking down Sydney, and I see a two story building, and it says, The Jewish Experience in Australia. That says Jewish experience. How many Jews can there be in Australia? Well, it happens that there were 200 families that migrated before World War II and after World War II to Australia. And in order for the children and the grandchildren to remember their activities, their successes, and so on, created this museum. I want to call it a museum, but it's, it's a, a museum about the Jewish experience in Australia. And I said to my wife, who was next to me, I says, in Miami we have a million and a half Cubans. Why don't we have a place for our children and grandchildren to learn what happened in the past 50 years? So I started by doing a video that some of you may have purchased, a Cuba from Columbus to Castro. And if you didn't purchase it, it's all gonna be out there for purchase after, uh, which is a short history of the, the, the country, the Cuba, for our children and grandchildren in English so they can understand what happened in Cuba and why the Cubans are here. The second part of this, it was done through this gener generous donation to create a series of interviews with prominent Cuban Americans. We are recording all of these interviews. We are sending them to the library to keep them there. And anybody that wants a copy will be happy to give a copy free of charge. Uh, so we have today a very prominent Cuban-American that has done well in the area of politics as well as in the area of business, Secretary Carlos Gutierrez. Carlos and I have been friends since the Bush administration, I guess. No? Yeah, even before. Even before that. And uh, we developed a, a very close relationship He's a hell of a guy, besides being a good politician and a good businessman. <laughs> All right, so basically this is the way we're going to proceed. I'm going to ask uh, Carlos uh, a number of questions about his background and so on, and then I'm going to open it for the public to ask questions. You want to ask him anything? He may not want to answer, but you can ask I'll him anything. anything. He'll, he'll answer anything. Okay, uh, first question. Tell me about your childhood. You were born in Cuba. What part of Cuba? Uh, Havana. Havana. Born in Havana. Uh, we left in uh, July of 1960. What about the mic? Take the mic. Ah, perdón, perdón. Uh, Havana, and we left in July of 1960. What were your parents doing in Cuba? Uh, my father was 40, so he was you know, an entrepreneur. He, he had, he had a 25% stake in a company called... Empacadora Mahawa in, uh, in Ciego de Avila. So they, they had uh, pineapple and they, uh, they canned it and they shipped it. So it was, you know, it was a small growing business. It was, uh, and uh, yeah, obviously we left it all. And on my mother's side, it, it, it's a curious thing, but my grandfather spent 57 years in the Cuban telephone company. And he started an office boy, and he made it to the top. So it was a uh, very two different, two different experiences, two different families. Uh, was that an inspiration to you? I think the inspiration was more on my father's side. 
Even though I can tell you that my father died a poor man, you know, and he tried to recreate what he had in Cuba. He opened up businesses in Mexico. They went uh, out of business. He, you know, it just, he had a very hard time, very hard time. So did you go to school in Cuba, primary education? I went to a school called Lestonac in Cuba, <clears throat> the Monjas. Um, they didn't convert you? For a little while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you arrived in the United States in the 1960s. July 1960, right when Eisenhower took away the sugar quota. Okay. You went to Miami? Went Miami. We went to a hotel on Collins Avenue called the Richmond, which is still there. And they still have the same logo. And I mean, it's unbelievable. So... Um, I didn't speak a word of Spanish. My brother was a little older, and he spoke a little bit of English. I, I didn't speak a word of English. So the bellboy used to teach me English. And he'd say, look, rubber band, and he'd go, rubber band. And, and that's how I started. Uh, eventually, as time went by, because we thought we were on vacation. You know, this guy can't last. I mean, we'll, we'll be back soon, you know? And after a while, my father said, look, I have to find a job. And you have to go to school. And so he started uh, parking cars in a parking lot and, you know, little by little. And, um, and I was put into school called Treasure Island Elementary School in Key Biscayne. And I remember the first three months were tough because I didn't speak English. So, but that's one way to learn English. You put somebody in school, you say, yeah, you learn. And that's it. Because they didn't have bilingual education or... Um, so we spent two years, uh, two years in Miami, and then we moved to New York City, because he, he got a better job in New York City. Not that it was a great job, but it was a better job than, than, than what he had in Miami. So we became citizens in New York City, and then he got a job in Mexico City, and that's when the whole family moved to Mexico City. And the job in Mexico City was with Heinz. In, in Mexico, it's uh, Alimentos Heinz or Del Fuerte. Um, so we moved to Mexico City. I went to junior high school, high school, university, started my career with Kellogg's in Mexico. My wife is Mexican. Two of my three children were born in Mexico. One is here in Querétaro, Mexico. So, uh, so that was the, uh, the experience. But the other incredible thing is Heinz went broke in Mexico. <laughs> so once again, we were on the road, you know? And a lot of it was he, they went broke because of, uh, I don't know if you know Mexican politics, but, but uh, Echeverria's policies were terrible. And uh, they were terrible for business. And so once again, the business went down the drain and we went to Fort Lauderdale. How did you start with Kellogg? Um, and why did you start with Kellogg? I had in, <clears throat> in, in, in Mexico, I had a FM2, which uh, is a residency paper. I, I, I wasn't a Mexican citizen, and, and it was very difficult to become a Mexican citizen. So it was hard to find a job if you weren't a Mexican, even though I had working papers. People didn't know the law. They said, you're not Mexican, I can't give you a job. So a friend of mine, a high school friend of mine, his father was the general manager of Kellogg's. He said, look, we can put you in a training program, a sales training program, and see how it goes. Uh, so that's how I started in, in sales, selling what they call in Mexico changarros, which bodegas, you know, so selling out of a Volkswagen van. It's a real story. I have a picture of it. Uh, selling out of a Volkswagen van to little stores. And, um, but what I was looking for was exactly the opposite of what my father was looking for. He wanted independence, his own business. He didn't want to work for every, anybody. And I saw that, and I said, I want stability. And what better stability than a big U.S. company? So that, that's why I joined Kellogg, and I, and I did my best to stick it out and stick it through. Two years after I was there, the, the, the general manager, 
whose son I knew was fired. So after that, I was on my own and just uh, just had to you know work my way up. Yeah, but it's very interesting that a Cuban American with limited experience in the food business all of a sudden becomes the chairman of Kellogg. Yeah, no, well, you know. <laughs> and, and, and this is no, no. This is important because this is important for younger people that are entrepreneurs that want to move up, that want to do well. How about your experience? Yeah, yeah. You know, the food business. I I always felt that I I wanted to go to the food business because my father was in the food business, right? He was in the pineapple business, and um, so I, I was a, I was attracted to the food business. I didn't think I was going to be chairman. I mean, if you asked me when I was driving a Volkswagen van, hey, you think you're going to be chairman? I, I wanted to be a supervisor, a sales supervisor in Mexico. And I said, maybe one day I could be a divisional manager. And who knows, one day maybe I could be a national sales manager of, Me of Kellogg in Mexico. So uh, what I learned now, I look back, is I took it step by step. You know, I have a job, do it well, good things happen. But I wasn't always thinking about, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. How long did it take you to become chairman? 25 years. Any resistance to a Cuban being a chairman, moving up? You know, I, I... Did you have somebody throwing darts at you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the... <laughs> <laughs> well, primero, you know, I don't have... I don't have a college degree, so... 20 years ago, I, would have, I wouldn't have had the guts to say that, okay? And I still have nightmares about not having, you know, not making it to the final exam and not the... So um, I had to compete. And um, I remember one time after I had become general manager of Kellogg Mexico, I had been in the company for uh, eight years, I spent five years as that. I told my boss, I said, I want to move. I've been here for five years. I think I've done a good job. And he said, uh, well, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to one of the big Anglo markets. Okay. At Kellogg, the big sophisticated markets were the Anglo markets. That's people eat more cereal, there's more competition. And, um, and he was surprised. He said, what, what do you mean? You don't want to be president of Latin America? And he kept asking me these types of questions. And I, I finally realized what he was saying is, if you're, a Latino. you're a Latin. Why don't you lead Latins? You know, you can't lead Anglos. Uh, so, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, throughout, throughout uh, you know, it's, it's not something that people walk up to you and say, you're Latino. You can't be in a, a U.S. corporation. But after a while, you sense, you know, you have an instinct for it. You sense who likes you, who doesn't. And, you know, you, you learn to develop uh, a sixth sense. How was that experience as chairman of a major corporation? Bueno, mira, my first 18 months were a disaster. A disaster. I, I'm lucky that the board believed in me enough to say, let's give this guy a little bit more time. Um, I brought in a guy from McKinsey who was, he was the number two in his MBA class at Harvard. Okay, just a guy who was... A, to show the board that I'm not afraid to surround myself with these people. And the guy turned out to be a terrible manager. If you put 15 things in front of him and said, pick three, he couldn't do it. He wanted to do all 15. So he couldn't manage, he couldn't lead. He drove the company nuts. I had to fire him after a year and a half. I brought in some other people, I had to fire them. And it was in, we had consultants and you know, I could stand up and give a speech about our strategy, but I didn't feel it. And it wasn't until about 18 months later. And I remember using Marti's phrase, our wine is bitter, but it's our wine. <laughs> so we said, you know what? Um, for, throw out all the consultants and we're gonna do our own charts. And our charts are clunky, but they're our charts. And, you know, the thoughts don't have a lot of buzzwords, but there are thoughts. And that's when things started to turn around, when I started following my gut and not trying to overthink things or not trying to have a consultant come in and tell me what the business should be. 
Uh, but the first, I'll tell you, and then because I, you know, people knew I had been in Mexico, I, uh, my first decision was to close down the original plant that, that Mr. Kellogg had built. In Mexico? No, no, in Battle Creek, Michigan. So somebody had to do it. It was a plant, it was a terrible plant. It was not productive, uh, old. It was just, you know, its time had come. But because we all lived in Battle Creek, and Battle Creek was a town of 30,000 people, everybody, you know, just, they didn't go near it. And I said, if I, you know, if I have the job, I'm going to do it. And if I don't do it, somebody else will. So I did it. And for the next, I mean, Karina, you remember, you were in junior high school, but um, the rumors were this Mexican guy is going to move the headquarters to Mexico. For the first two and a half years, I would say, um, it, it wasn't easy. I mean, remember, you, I remember one Halloween when we opened the door, trick or treat. We opened the door. The guy said, "Thanks for firing my uncle." And you know, <laughs> so we weren't very popular in Battle Creek for the first two and a half years. At the end of the day, it worked, and I spent six years as CEO. And when I left, yeah, people said thank you, and uh, but but it wasn't an easy time. So from that, you went into politics. I went into politics, yeah. And I had what? To, Why? I was not involved in politics. Uh, I, you know, I was a Republican because my father told me I was a Republican. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but I wasn't involved. I was interested. You know, I was interested. I read. I, but, uh, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't engaged. Um, and I met, I met President Bush in 1998 when he was starting his campaign. And then I, when, he, uh, when he became president, I received a call from the White House saying, would you like to serve as something? And I said, look, I just took over Kellogg. The place is a disaster. I can't leave. I just can't do it. I think they were thinking about a commission or something. And so... Four years went by, and, and President Bush came to Battle Creek to give a speech in his uh, campaign for the second term. And the incredible thing is, you know, he's always on time or early. He arrived in Battle Creek early to give a speech at a baseball stadium. And at the end of the speech, I was in a line with, uh, you know, the local people. Uh, um, and, uh, and he came up to me. He said, Carlos, are you going to join the team this time? And I said, well, Mr. President, I haven't been asked, but I can't say no to you. That's, se me ocurrió decir eso, I didn't, you know. So I was walking out, and I told a friend of mine, he said, you know what, I think the president just offered me a job. He said, look, he says that to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> a week later, my, my assistant comes in and says, uh, you have a call from the White House. Oh, my God. <clears throat> the, the, the important thing, two things. One is the business was better, and two, I had a successor. If I, if I didn't, successor. If I didn't have that, I couldn't just walk out and say, hey, you know, good luck. Um, and the successor I had was somebody who was on the board who I brought in thinking about, you know, you, you have two succession plans. One is, what if you get hit by a bus tomorrow? And the other one is, you know, who's going to be the guy 10, 15 years from now or the woman 10, 15 years from now? And I got hit by the commerce bus. But I, I was, I'm glad I had, I had a successor and the business was doing better. But they're so good at the White House. The, 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 the personnel people are so good. Before you know it, you're sitting in the Oval Office and, you know, you can't say no. And, you, you know, it's uh, – but something in my gut said go for it. You know, and, and uh, there are times when your mind fails you, but your gut rarely does. And my brain was saying, you're crazy. I remember your sister, when she found out that I was taking a 95% pay cut, she said, Daddy, what, <laughs> what's wrong? I mean, what's, <laughs> you know, are you nuts? Are you crazy? So, uh, but it just felt like the right thing to do. And I'll tell you, I, in, after having been through the first two years, the first two and a half years at Kellogg, that were so difficult, and then getting out of that, it, it started to feel routine. The quarterly numbers, the annual budget, the, you know, it just, 
And I didn't realize until I got to Washington that I wasn't as professionally satisfied as I thought. Because I got to Washington, and I, I used to check the stock price of Kellogg 30 times a day. You know, I'd turn around, press enter, and it would update the stock price, just out of habit. The first day I was at Commerce, you said, what's the stock price of Kellogg? I don't know. I forgot about Kellogg because the government absorbs you. Uh, so the best job I've ever had was commerce, was government. What was the worst thing that happened to you at commerce? Uh, I would say two things. One is when, uh, when, uh, when we lost immigration, <clears throat> when we didn't get uh, immigration reform passed. And the other one was when Nancy Pelosi uh, went against the president and decided not to put the Colombia Free Trade Agreement up for a vote. And knowing what Colombia was going through with the FARC and, uh, the, you know, just the, and, and, and the job that President Uribe was doing and how much they deserved it, you know, uh, th those two were real, real disappointments. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with President Bush, what kind of guy he was. Uh. Yeah, President Bush is, you know, he is, he is who he is. He, you could see it. There's no, no air. Somebody was once telling me, he said, President Bush, when he's talking to you, he will never break into French. You know, he's not that kind of a guy. <laughs> he, won't, uh, he won't throw out a French word just to sound sophisticated. Uh, so the first time I met him, I was with my wife and the president, or the, uh, the, uh, the candidate. And the first thing he said, I like your shoes. That was just the first thing he said to me, I like your shoes. And, Did he take him uh, off? He, Did he take him off you? No, 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 he didn't. <laughs> um, but he's, just, he's a regular guy. He, uh, he's an extrovert, very much an extrovert. So um, he likes to speak Spanish. And like all good extroverts, he, um, he doesn't mind making mistakes. And that's why he's been able to learn Spanish. He doesn't speak as good as, but, as Jeb, but he speaks Spanish. Even though he used to call me Carlositos. <laughs> Pero, you know, the reality is that, that the, the, the Secretary of Commerce is a, is a big job, but it's not, it's not one of the big four. You know, it's not uh, defense, state, uh, the Attorney General, and what's the for treasury? Huh? So I would see him, I don't know, maybe once, twice, three times a month. You know, I wasn't in his office every day. But he was always just a, a great guy, great, and he was a leader. So it, you know, I remember in, in 2006, right in the middle of the war in Iraq, right in the middle of the worst time in Iraq, he would walk into a cabinet meeting and he'd pick people up. Come on, don't get down. This is, we're going to work this out. We're going to get through this. And uh, I don't want anybody, you know, looking like they're sad. We're going to, unbelievable. And, and when things got bad, he made himself more visible. And I've seen a lot of leaders that when things get bad, they shut the door of their office and they don't want to see anybody. He was just the opposite. He's an amazing, an amazing guy. So, um, and I think he, he got a very bad rap by the press. Uh, he's a guy who read a tremendous amount. He had incredible political instincts. He was able to make instinctive political decisions very quickly. And he surrounded himself with very good people. You know, Karl Rove, uh, just, he had a lot of very good people around him and very loyal because he never let you, he never said go that way. And then when he realized it was politically dangerous, He'd leave you over there and he'd go this way. Never. He'd never do that to his people. So his people were tremendously loyal to him. One of the things you got involved as the Secretary of Commerce was in Cuba policy and in developing a study about Cuba. Yeah, th th that was for me was like, you know, it was a dream because um, there was a commission that was formed with Mel Martinez and Colin Powell. So I, I went on that commission with Condi, and uh, I, I got very involved, and Condi was amazing. 
because she said, look, Cuba, I have a thousand things to think about. You go ahead and, and, and do Cuba. So, I mean, the experiences that we had were just uh, amazing. You know, we had uh, conference calls with the first lady and dissidents at the intersection. Um, I don't know how many cell phones we sent down there. Uh, I mean, it was, it, was, it was fantastic, you know, just being in national security meetings and talking. And that was the time when, um, when Fidel got sick and people said he was dying. And I got to tell you, uh, uh, Brian, is Brian Littell here? No, he's not. So the CIA would come <laughs> to my office and they go, we have some news for you. Um, he's still alive, but he's very sick. Oh, boy, that's great. That's, I mean, how'd you get that information? How did you, you know? So nobody knew and every day it was, every day it was a rumor and we had, um, it's still classified, but we had a flow chart of, you know, what would we do the day he died and what would happen and what would Cuba be like? And, so that was, that was a, a, a very exciting, and, and, and that's when I got involved with you and, and, uh, and, and really regained a curiosity about Cuba that I had as, as, you know, when I was younger. But afterwards, I, you know, I started reading about business and started reading about other things and studying. And, uh, but when I got to commerce is when I really just became a, you know, a fanatic, a voracious reader about the history of Cuba, starting with Jaime's book. <laughs> I, I didn't want to plug, but that's all right. I'll take it. <laughs> uh, any desire to go back to government? I don't want to say no, be, just in case I don't get invited back. I would go back in the right position, you know? Uh, I wouldn't go back just to go back. But it, it, the right challenge, and I'm not talking about the right level, but the right challenge, the right, the, something that would, um, that would keep me challenged, excited. Y you know, if there's one thing that I think I've earned is the opportunity to do what I like. So if there's something I like, I would, I would, I would go for it. How about that against uh, chairman of another big company? I don't know if I want that. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, you know. Your, mo your wife is not spending enough money? You know? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, when I, when I first left government, uh, I, you know, it's not like I had 20 offers. I had a few offers. Uh, one thing I said is I will never again live in a small town. Battle Creek, Michigan is a tough place. Uh, you know, 30,000 people, it, you, you know, and, and it's just after a while, it was a great place to raise a family, but after a while you just, you felt like, so I said I'll never again go back to a, to a town, to a suburb. I wanted to be in New York, in Washington, in Miami, um, but I'll tell you, now looking back at the, at the Kellogg experience, it was a pressure cooker for 30 years, okay? So I wasn't uh, a Mexican, so if I lost that job, I wouldn't be able to live in Mexico, even though my wife was Mexican and I had a son who was Mexican. Um, I didn't have a college degree, so my goodness, I had to, if this guy worked 10 hours, I had to work 16. And um, I knew that I had to get the numbers because my, my protection was that I got the numbers. That's how, that's how I could say, okay, look, you don't like my education, but look at my numbers. Um, so it, it, was a, it, it was a 30 year pressure cooker. I don't remember one day where I said, well, today is gonna be a great day. It just every single day. Do I wanna do that again? I don't know. I really don't know. All right, who are you supporting for president? Jeb. Okay. You know, I'm very proud of Marco. I mean, I, and, and I, supported, I supported Jeb before Marco decided to run. I have a certain loyalty towards the Bush family. I like the Bush family. I, I like what they learn at the dinner table. I like the type of people they are. They're, they're just, they're, they're, they're values. They're, they don't, even though W had a swagger, 
He never bragged. Jeb doesn't brag. 41 doesn't brag. You know, they just, they're a special family. And, um, and I, I do feel a sense of loyalty towards President Bush. So, um, you know, it's, it's not easy because uh, sometimes I think, my God, I'm Cuban-American, I'm not supporting a Cuban-American. But um, I, I, I think loyalty is important. Now, one issue that you're involved and you've been very interested in is the issue of immigration. Yeah. Now, what do you think we should do? What do you think is going to happen? Well, I mean, eventually something has to happen because it's, th there are three things to immigration. W one is uh, border security. And border security is a buzzword. Porque border security, 40% of the people who are here undocumented came through airports. So you know, the idea of we have to build a fence in the border is, is just, it's a talking point. The second thing is, what do you do with 12 million people who are here, who don't have working papers, but many of them have children who think they're American? Many have been here for 10, 20, 15, 15 20 years. Um, I think that the consensus is we're not going to round up 12 million people and kick them out, but we're not going to give them a passport either. So what do you do? And that's where, that's where the, 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 the tension is. The third thing is the most important one, but it's the one that people talk the least about, is what is the legal immigration system? Because the reason we have illegal immigration is because our laws don't work. Our laws were made in the 1950s. And we're trying to apply them, you know, in the 21st century. So, for example, um, in, this, in the Senate bill that was done under Marco, the, the quota for agricultural workers is 112,000 per year. If you talk to an agricultural a farmer, they'll tell you we need from 750,000 to a million. So where do you get the other 900,000? Either you shut down your farm, you move it to Mexico, or you hire someone who's undocumented. The quota for construction workers is 15,000. Every time I hear that, I say, we need 15,000 in Miami not nationwide. The quota for PhDs, MBAs, um, uh, what they call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, is um, they took it up to about 90,000. The 90,000 is taken up by the month of February. That's why Microsoft is building R&D centers in Vancouver, because they can't find the people in the U.S. We don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough doctors. We don't have enough truck drivers. It just, it's an economic fact. So if, if, if the working force is not growing, the only way you can grow your economy is through productivity. And you can't have 3 4% productivity every year. So it, it's just the reality of life. Without immigration, our population doesn't grow. If our population doesn't grow, our economy begins to decline. It's what's happening in Japan. It's what's happening in the European Union and many countries. Uh, China, it's going to happen to China in about 20 years, where the population gets too old and you don't have enough young people to support the population. And you don't have enough people to support the economic growth. So what is the likelihood that we're going to have some sort of an agreement on, on immigration? Look, I think there's an important thing here, and I think this is where Jeb is right. I think Jeb is right. And he was criticized a little bit in his book. I don't know how many of you have seen his book, but Jeb talks about legalization. Okay, so if you pass a background check and if you pay a fine and if you, all these things. Um, you can be legal, which means you can work. It means you can go home and come back, but it doesn't say anything about citizenship. In fact, um, perhaps you can't become a citizen, but you can work here. 
the the Senate bill broke a law that a law broke a rule that both parties had, and that is, if you're going to legalize people and make them citizens, they should not cut into the line. So if you say everyone can become a can have a green card in 10 years, you're essentially cutting into the line. So Jeb's idea is, look, you're legal, but we have a process for for citizenship. And if you want to be a citizen, go to the process. If you're from the Philippines, that can take you 80 years because the line is so long. If you're from, I don't know, if you're from Germany, maybe it's quicker. Um, so I, I think that's a distinction. And this is where politics becomes very cynical. Um, one party says, no, 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 we don't want second class citizens. If there isn't a path to citizenship, no reform. Well, a path of citizenship happens in 15 years. And in the bill that we had, it was 14 to 18 years. So if you ask an undocumented immigrant, do you want to uh, kill this bill because in 15 years you can't be a citizen? Or do you want this bill because tomorrow you can be legal? And when you go to work, you know you're going to come back to see your family. I think he'd say, make me legal. In, um, in, in 1986, when, when President Reagan did his so-called amnesty, only 46% chose to become U.S. citizens. Because people wanted to go back. They want to go back home. They want to make U.S. dollars, go back to their hometown and build a little house and be a hero. And you know, not, it, it's, and, and, and the world is a lot more, there's a lot more mobility and circularity. People come, they work in the summer, they go back home in the winter. Uh, so this thing of citizenship, that's why some people cynically say that, um, what do they call them? They say uh, um, that uh, illegal immigrants are also called undocumented Democrats. <laughs> because, you know, the theory is they're going to vote Democrat, so let's make them citizens. And I just, I find that very cynical, that you deny them legalization because you want them to be able to vote for you in 15 years. And, and it's so easy to demagogue the issue, you know. Uh, the Republicans want you to be a second-class citizen. It took me 14 years to get citizenship for my wife and for my son, for just because of things, you know, the way circumstantial, the way things happened. That's, that's you know. Okay, Carlos, I can't let you go without asking you a question. How do you feel about Obama's Cuba policy? Boy, this was going so great. It was, uh, you know, I, I, the, when I heard it, and, and it's interesting because I, I, I was probably a list of 50 people, and 30 minutes before, I got a call from Penny Pritzker. Say, oh, I want to tell you, Secretary, and you're going to like the news that we're going to do this and announce this tonight. And, uh, and I went on CNN that afternoon, and I said, you know, Cuba got a very good deal. And we, we lost our, sh we, you know, we gave everything. We gave everything and got nothing. So up until now, all the regulations have been issued. Uh, from the U.S. side and travel and the credit cards and re what regulations have come out of Cuba. And the, the interesting thing that's happened, and this may be one of the positive things, is that Cuba is getting overwhelmed with businesses that want to go in and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to handle it. They're, they're afraid of losing control. And... Um, and that's going to be something to watch. You know, they, they've agreed that Cubans can open small businesses. And I think for Cubans, that's great. And that one day they can aspire to buy a house. You know, I, I don't care who made the policy. I'm glad that Cubans can start their own business now. Uh, but they don't know what to do with big companies. They just don't know what to do. But they've opened the box. So um, it's, it's going to be uh, interesting to watch. My prediction is that President Obama will submit 
the embargo for a vote because it's his only chance for a legacy and he knows that he ha he's built the sandcastle. The next president is going to come in and he's not going to have the same passion to just give and give and give and, and, and not get anything in return. So uh, it was interesting, the day that, uh, the day that it happened, uh, CNN was saying, Cubans in Havana are celebrating after December 17. What they didn't know is they were celebrating because of the five spies, not because we're now friends with the U.S., you know. And, uh, and, and a lot of people don't understand it. They think that, uh, they think it means that that's it, it's all over. We can do business now. Um, but so, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of naivety around this. And um, I don't know what else is gonna come, but I, I, I am convinced that President Obama wants to do it. And he is going to do as much as he can. Even though the Cubans are saying, no, no, you're not doing enough. You can do more. You know, it's almost as if though we're begging them to let us be their friend. And, and we know there's a history, right? Eisenhower, Ford, Carter, Clinton, the closer you get, the more you, you know, the more you regret it. And I'm just wondering when the day will come when Obama will realize that this wasn't what he thought it was. Okay, thank you. Carlos, let's open it for the... Mike. Uh, Mr. Secretary, was there, was there a time in which you had to sacrifice your, not your values, but your, your view of, of Cuba in order to be part of the team when you were part of the government? Um, n not not in the Bush administration because they were so, they were so aligned and they were so, you know, viscerally, President Bush hates dictators. Um, so I, I never had pressure to, you know, to go the other way or to, you know, um, from, from the very beginning, I think he, he was, he, I think he's the only president to have said my policy is regime change. Wait. Um, God knows, wonderful as always. And I'm glad you had a part-time job at Kellett and a full-time job with the government. <laughs> but listen, here's one thing. We got an election coming up in 2016. We have something that, like you say, people who are born here, Okay, whose parents are not citizens, they're here, you know, they didn't play by the rules, they were illegal. If we pass the DREAM Act, we're guaranteeing the White House. Seriously. The DREAM Act cannot hurt anybody. These yeah. people are ready in this system. They're as American as we are, number one. Number two, if you talk to let's you, you hit it right on the nail when you said, do they want citizenship? Most of these people, my son has to hire a lot of them, and they want to go home. So I don't know, we lobbied, I was chairman of the U.S.-Mexico Chamber, and we lobbied for five million work permits. You give these people work permits, they're very happy. <coughs> they can go home, and they got a legal way of being in our system. Nine months, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and they go back, and they really want that. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't see how we I, I agree. Yeah, and, and you asked about whether I ever felt uh, discrimination, but not the way Mexicans feel it. I mean, when I, when I came to the U.S., I felt like I was welcomed, like, like people wanted me to succeed. You know, people come on in and, you know, just play by our rules and we hope you do the best and we're sorry what happened to your country and all, all, all that all stuff. So to think that you know, these kids, these dreamers, they, they arrived at five years old. Some of them don't even speak Spanish. They think they're American, they play Little League, and all of a sudden they graduate from high school and they can't go to university because they didn't decide to come here, their parents brought them. 
So I understand the rule of law. I understand we're a country of laws. But uh, what are people going to say 30 years from now if we don't renew or pass the DREAM Act? That we, I don't know, that we took, I think there are officially about um, 600,000 DACA eligible dreamers. That we took 600,000 kids and just threw them on the street? And a lot of these, a lot of these students are straight A students. They're, you know, on a roll. It's amazing, you know, to to to, to know that not, it's not guaranteed that you can go to university, but you still get straight A's. It's incredible will, you no? Know? So I I I hope that, uh, and then you, that that's what hurts the party is when you have somebody say, oh, if I get elected, I'm going to. Um, uh, repeal DACA. I mean, that's, you know, a 17 year old or a 25 year old hears that and they start crying. Or the children that are here that don't really integrate. Or they don't integrate, that's exactly. The is that they're here and they're really nowhere. And, you know, they feel separate. That's right. That's just. That's exactly right. At the end of the day, yeah, we, we keep them isolated yeah. instead of. Um, and this idea that, you know, uh, Hispanics don't assimilate, that's crazy. It, it, it does, it's just not the way history has been. And uh, we know that second generation uh, Hispanic children, Mexican Americans more so than Cuban Americans, don't speak Spanish very much. So, of course, they assimilate. It's just, yes. And not only that, I mean, I agree with Rule of law and so forth, but the uh, immigration crime lacks mens rea, lacks the intention to do harm. Yeah, that's that's right. Crime. And personally, I, I cannot think of a more important crime than avoiding the draft. And uh, you know, we have the president of the United States who avoided the draft, giving amnesty, uh, and 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 Carter gave them amnesty, right. You know, that's a, that's a good point, because crossing the border illegally without documents is a misdemeanor. But then what, the people who don't want reform will say, ah, but if you use the fake Social Security card, that's a felony. So, you know, they'll always have something that they can, but, but yeah, it's a, it's a misdemeanor. So. And you're yes. distributing money to somebody else. <laughs> okay, thank you. Go ahead. I heard you talking about the Cuban situation. <clears throat> Mike posed a question to you. This reminds me a little bit of what's happening in Cuba and Iran. When Israel was established in 1948, they went through a tremendous economical crisis. And in a meeting of the government, Golda Meir proposed they didn't know what to do. People were going hungry. Israel was suffering a lot. Israel, uh, Golda Meir proposed to declare war to declare war on the United States. But you're crazy. We are going to lose, we are going to destroy us. Precisely, look what happened with the Marshall Plan. <laughs> now, with Cuba and Iran, we are seeing here that we are losing our soul. I'm 83 years old. I was in a Cuban jail. I come from Jewish parents that were expelled. My whole family was destroyed in Lithuania, killed except my parents. And I'm listening that we are losing our soul. We are not only counting the economical things, how many people are going to get a job, and something like that. What happens, we are, we are giving a price to all the criminals, to Iran, obviously, plotting to destroy our system with Hezbollah in Latin America, in Hamas, and all of that. And we are trying, by all means, to build these people, to destroy us. They want to destroy us. What is the rational? <laughs> Somebody think. Yeah. That we are helping all the people that want to destroy this system. They have no intention. What has Cuba done? A member of my family has just put in jail over 20 years in Cuba. He did nothing. How can I support the fact that so many things and Gaviota is going to take 52% of the income that they arrive to continue? Also, the anti the Cuba is not a longer a terrorist country because they have shipped a single terrorist in six months to Latin America to create guerrilla wars. We don't need to have, they, we have, they have Brazil, they have Ecuador, they have Venezuela, they have Nicaragua. What is the rationale for all this madness? 
what is irrational? Yeah, I, I think the, the point that you made is, I think is the, the most important point, is if, if, you ha if the country is an enemy, then how can you make friends with an enemy? Someone, and an enemy for me is someone who wants to destroy you. They would like to see the country go into the ocean. Continue with what you were doing with the sanctions. Iran was suffering with the sanctions, not so much yeah. because I built 59 shopping centers in Tehran in the last three years. So, I, because this is, the New York Times and all these people created, in the case of Cuba, Londoño wrote six editorials about Cuba, like Cuba was so important. And then Iran, now we, we give them all this. They, they uh, Senator, uh, Secretary Kerry doesn't want to talk about anything but the bomb. Uh, the bomb, the rest, they can kill people, they can do all kinds of things. How can, how can you explain that? You know, and that's such a big problem. One, one thing that people criticize about the Bush administration is that, I don't know if you recall, but uh, Condi uh, and the president took North Korea off the terror list. And there's a feeling that they did it for legacy, you know, to show that you know, we were the ones who opened up North Korea. And that's a very dangerous thing. And, and I think people in the Bush administration will tell you it was a very dangerous thing. Everything that President Obama is doing today is for his legacy. When he makes a speech saying, I see a world without nuclear weapons, I mean, people laugh. But one day people say, remember when he said that? He was, he was the first one who said that. Everything he does. And that's what makes the next 18 months so scary. You don't know what he's going to do? Um, because your story is very interesting in reference to how you were young and you were in the um, Kellogg's uh, Corporation. You did not have, you know, your degree and yet you pulled forward. And I would like to find out uh, what can be done for students who are attending universities and they're, and they're obtaining their degrees. They have student loans that do not permit them to even acquire a, reg a, a job in their field. Uh, and secondly, um, corporations nowadays is not quite like the corporation of the time period when you were in Kellogg's. Because now they're hiring, what they're doing is that they're hiring through um, uh, candidates, but through temp agencies. And this puts a, a very big tamper on um, young people that have this notion that working for a corporation is a security for them. How can this be changed? Look, I, I think the uh, I think the education system is a little bit flawed. It hasn't changed for 50 years. So what people learn in four years is pretty much the same as, as they learned 40, 50 years ago. And think about how much the world has changed. So when I went to university, I was already working. And I picked the courses that I wanted to take. And, and I learned those courses. And they served me well for my whole career. Today, people learn things that they're never going to use. So we still have, you know, liberal arts. That's wonderful, liberal arts. But what are you going to do with liberal arts? So I, what I see is education becoming more pragmatic, uh, training people for a job. The, the student loan thing is, I mean, we do have the most expensive education in the world, the best at a university level. Um, but there's also, you know, a counter trend. The internet is coming in. Uh, you've got companies like Laureate. You have companies that are doing online services. Uh, education is going through a tremendous change. There will always be people who want to be in Miami or be in Harvard, be there at the building and all that and the, the place. Um, and perhaps those people can afford it. But more and more, there are ways of getting education without having mm -hmm. to spend the rest of your life repaying the loan. 
And how is that? Where? Well, there are online there are online schools. Phoenix is one. I think Laureate has another degree. Um, and many of these are recognized, and they don't cost forty thousand dollars a year. And what about if, if a, a solution to, to my you know understanding would be if we can provide some sort of where high school students will get a, a hands-on training on, on technology, you know, like uh, and and or you know, skills like becoming a mechanic. Um, you know. So, it's it, it, it's a good question. I had I had a client from India who had come up with this idea that was brilliant. They figured out that in a uh, computer science degree, you get about a hundred and forty hours of classwork. Of those one hundred and forty hours, twenty seven are computer science related. So what they do is they bring high school students uh, from the inner city who don't have opportunities or community college graduates and they put them through a 90-day boot camp and, and they focus on those 27 hours and they come out knowing as much or more than the than the ones who studied for four years. And I think all of that is being recognized. Uh, and I, ironically, when, when, when I was in business, you know, having a Harvard degree, that, you know, that guaranteed that you made it to the top. I think there's a little bit of suspicion today about whether that's so, whether you know, the only thing you need is a degree. But I, don't, I wish I had a better answer for you on the student loans. I never, that's, that's an advantage of not graduating, is I didn't have that problem, or not so. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Secretary, uh, you mentioned earlier that President Bush has the ability to surround himself with very, very good people. And all of us, those of us here that have managed businesses, we learn very quickly that the first thing we need to do is surround ourselves with a lot of people that are smarter than we are, and we listen to them. When you look at this policy making coming out of the White House, is it a failure of leadership or is it a failure of someone f just simply failing to surround himself with good people or just not listening to the advice? How do you, how do you play that? I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, management is something that is not valued in Washington. So we elect um, we elect someone, or we elected someone, who had no executive experience for the biggest executive job in the world. I mean, with all humility, I can tell you, I don't think President Obama could have run Kellogg. But he's running something that's, you know, a thousand, a million times bigger than Kellogg. Um, and you can see it. I mean, you can see the way the, the, the Affordable Care Act was rolled out. Uh, Sibelius. What they said to her is that, you know, aside from your Secretary of Health job, uh, execute the Affordable Care Act. 17% of the economy. Go ahead, just, you know, y you can figure it out. It was crazy. And, and you can see that there isn't, there, there's no experience. The experience of surrounding yourself with people who can, um, who can, who know things that you don't know. What I understand is that the President listens to two maybe three people, and that's about it. And the cabinet is out there, and they're pretty much on their own. Um, I always, if I, if I can just expand on this, because this is something I talk about a lot. My daughter has heard me say this too many times, but I'll say it again. The, uh, the f four things that I saw, that, that I've seen in, in great leaders, um, and I saw this in President Bush. W one is uh, will. You know, everybody wants to be the boss, but who has the will to, to lead? The, the will to lead when things are tough. You know, to know that the whole thing is on your shoulder and, and, and you're going to confront it and you're going to be visible when things are bad and uh, not all bosses have that. The other thing is self-awareness, right? Know who you are and who you're not. I wish I would have known this 30 years ago. 
Because I thought a leader 30 years ago had to do all the talking. He had to win every argument. And, uh, and he had to be the smartest person in the room. And, uh, and I realize now what, you know, how obnoxious I probably was with my people when I started managing people. So self-awareness, what are you good at and what are you not good at? And what you're not good at, bring in people who are. So I, I talk a lot about my role model was uh, Roberto Isueta. You know, I was sitting in Mexico and I get this Fortune magazine copy with a Cuban American on the front that says he's CEO of Coca-Cola. I said, my God, what is this? If, you know, maybe another Cuban American could do it. That was, that was my, I, I call it my secret weapon. I had a role model. So I became a student of Goizueta. I think I know more about Coke than the Coke people do. So um, Goizueta was shy, a very strong Cuban accent, but he had a mind for business, um, to create value. He, he had a feel for how do you create value. So as his number two person, he hired Don Quixote. He made him president. Don Quixote was a backslapping Irishman who gave great speeches and everybody loved him. And here's the thing. Quixote was Roberto's competitor for the top job. So the third thing that I always that I I notice about great leaders is they believe in something bigger than themselves. That's what I don't see in the president today, especially in the last two years. He believes in his legacy. He believes in doing, you know, what's right so that people can read about him in ten years. By when Roberto put Don Quixote in that job, knowing he was his competitor and that there were people on the board who thought Kiho should have the job. He was saying, what's important here is not me. It's the institution of Coca-Cola. And that, I think that is an incredible, incredible leadership trait. Mr. Secretary, you have significant experience in Asia. I want to know your thoughts on how you view the world vis-a-vis -vis Asia. And since Russia has a significant pre uh, presence in the region, what you think about the Russian military's activism, increasing activism, and the Chinese military's increasing acti activism. Yeah, I, I think they're, um, they're two very different cases. And I, I know that a lot of people don't like the fact that I go to China about four times a year. Um, I don't see anything communist about China. Um, Russia is, uh, and, and what the, the problem with China is the South China Sea. Um, all these little islands, and everyone is building up a navy. So the, 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 the battleground of the South China Sea is on water. So even the Philippines are building a navy. And that is probably the biggest concern in Asia that, that, that worries people. Um, the Russians are different in the sense that they're, I, I think Russians are more tactical. The, if you're an enemy of the US, you're my friend. And Putin saw uh, a little opening in Georgia, and he went for it. Sakashvili made a mistake, and he invited him in. Um, he saw an opening in Ukraine, he went for it. I don't think Putin has a master plan. I think he's a tactician, which makes him very dangerous, because you never know what he's going to do. He's just an opportunist. But you know, it's it very obvious that after the sanctions, after Ukraine, he took a trip to Bolivia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Cuba, and Nicaragua. I mean, pretty obvious. So I would be more, and I, I, this is my own personal opinion, um, over the next 10, 20 years, more concerned about Russia than China. Um, and I'll, t I'll tell you something else, and maybe this is not a, a popular thing to say, but I, I sometimes hear people say, Boy, I, I worry about Cuba adopting the China model. Um, again, I go to China four times a year, and I've been going to China for 
15 years, maybe 20. Uh, gosh, I, I wish Havana looked like Shanghai. <laughs> you know? I mean, China, the Communist Party runs China, but there's very little communist to the Communist Party. So it's a, it's a very different story. I think the Chinese have a little bit more wisdom. I think they think more long term. Um, they, they understand that, you know, e even though Mao was the person who united China, that he made a terrible mistake, that the Cultural Revolution was one of the great disasters of the 20th century. Um, but the Chinese are wise, and they know how to execute. And they run China like General Electric runs the company. They give the governors um, a budget. They expect the governors to make the budget. Um, they move people around, so they're constantly developing people. One day you're the mayor of this, then the next day you're the governor, the next day you're the secretary of something. So it's people development. Whereas, you know, in our system, we have somebody come in for 18 months and they go back to the private sector. And, and, and those are things that, that worry me from an economic point of view. China's history of, of, uh, of taking territory is close to home. Vietnam. Taiwan, you know, the, China hasn't ventured to conquer Europe. Uh, China hasn't tried to create an empire out of Asia. Russia has. And that, that's something to, uh, to worry about. Cool. Carlo, excellent talk, and I'm just very proud. Uh, what would you recommend that our generation can do? This is the question. Another dog. You wanted to meet General Banachero of Mexico? <laughs> you wanted to meet General Banachero? Yes. Roberto Boisueta, when he came back to Cuba from Yale, mm -hmm. Ken Crosby interviewed him, and Roberto said, I want to be Banachero of Coca Cola Havana. That's right. <laughs> and then, that's right. And then they sent him to uh, Bermudas, no? Yeah, uh, when, when they sat on his yeah. was That's right. He wanted. Yeah, that's right. Instead of going to his father's sugar business, yeah, he I, wanted I, I, to. I wanted so what would you recommend our generation can do? Look, I think I, I, the Cuban-American generation, our generation, uh, we've done a great job in the sense of making sure that our children are proud to be Cubans. You don't see that in other Latin countries. In fact, what you see is, you know, oh, don't, you know, don't tell people where you're from or don't speak Spanish or uh, you know, try to assimilate. That doesn't happen in a Cuban household. We never let kids forget that they're special because they were born in Cuba. And we never let them forget the history. I, I think that says a lot about our generation. And it makes us very unique. And I hope that this series will help our younger Cubans understand the work, the suffering, and the success of Cuban Americans. And on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank Secretary Gutierrez.